<laughs> Yo, what's good, everyone? It's your boy BQ. Didn't realize that I have the the uh, the camera. Uh, my bad. Hope everyone is well. Uh, this is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling review from this uh, this past Thursday. So I'm sorry I'm getting this up late. Um, on the last upload I did or the one before, I, I kind of let everyone know that I was uh, kind of had a week where I was a little out of pocket because I wasn't feeling well. And it's not that that affects my podcasting schedule whole up a whole lot, but it it affects everything, you know. And then and then podcasting kind kind of comes late after that. So the other part of it, I wasn't overly motivated to watch this episode because I was there for it, you know. So it's kind of it's kind of difficult to see the show live and then go home and have to watch it all over again. I'm not really a watch an episode twice type of dude, so. Uh, I wasn't overly motivated to watch it, but I did get around to it. So, you know, I don't like to draw a podcast on a Tuesday night from a Thursday show, but, you know, I've been doing it for years and I think you guys have forgiven me. So let's get into it. I did do a separate upload talking about Jordan Grace in the Royal Rumble. So you guys can go ahead and check that out. I had actually watched the whole event. Uh, for, unfortunately, it was spoiled for me. I don't read i tell you guys all the time i don't read any sort of spoilers dirt sheets nothing i always want wrestling to be a surprise for me but um, unfortunately i'm involved in so many chats and and uh dms that everything does get spoiled for me eventually but uh you know so it's it's pretty rare that i actually catch an uh, <laughs> an actual surprise unfortunately but it would have been really cool if that was one of them for me but um, I did talk about it in a separate upload, so definitely check that out. So let's talk this episode of Impact. We had the first explosion, and I plan on uh, sometime tomorrow actually reviewing that. I don't know if exp reviewing explosion is going to be a thing for me because they're just kind of matches with an interview. But I at least want to review this first one and you know, kind of compare it to what they used to do before, compare it to uh, BTI and all that, and you know. Get a get a just give me overall thoughts of what I think about it, and hopefully, it is successful going forward. I think it's going to be a lot more success, uh, successful than the old explosion. I think it's going to be more successful than BTI. Um, I think I might be more successful than BTI. So, um, looking forward to watching it though. That's another thing. I was there for both of those matches for Shira versus Rhino and uh, Swan versus Joe Hendry. But I still do want to see how they come off. Uh, I want to hear Jim Miller on commentary. I want to hear the Jim Miller interview segment, which I'm praying to God does not have music playing in the background, but I feel like it probably does. So hopefully next week also I get back to live streaming the reviews. It was just kind of pointless this particular episode because it's it's coming out so late. So let us uh let us get into it once for your mind. Uh, the opening match. So we had Chris Bay versus Kevin Knight. I really like Kevin Knight. I don't think he's someone who's signed signed. I think he's one of those people who kind of comes and goes. So they leave him on the roster page, but I think he's excellent. And I think he wrestles in Japan. Am I correct on that? Is that what he is? His, his, uh, where he's based his home base. I don't know. I don't really care. I mean, I care about him, but I just care so little about New Japan and all that. I just, I have no clue. So someone will let me know. One of you guys will let me know. But I think he's extremely talented, obviously extremely athletic. And I feel like they could do something with him in the X Division. I don't think that they will. They kind of use him as a, as a, I don't know if a good hand is the right term, but he's a, he doesn't win. <laughs> he, he definitely doesn't win. I couldn't tell you what his finisher is. Not a clue. Um, so this was no different. He didn't win here, but I thought this was a was a good matchup. I thought it was um, I enjoyed it quite a bit when I was there. I knew it was random, so I said, you know what, something's probably going to happen after this match, and it did. The grizzled young vets jumped the ABC after the match. There was a theme to this show that I hope they don't continue, and it was four out of the six matches. We're not even going to count Dango's match. So four out of five had post-match beatdown angles. This has been done to death 
in AEW, they do it almost after almost every match every week. I really hope Impact is not or TNA is not falling into that habit because it got old for AEW months ago. Months ago. I hope that I hope they're not I hope that's not the way they decide they're going to start progressing angles because that's what you do when you're creatively bankrupt. And you do not you don't know how to write good stories for people. Can't come up with a more creative way to build a feud. And I hope it's not becoming the new bump into each other in the hallway that they were doing for so many years. Do not do these post-match angles, these post-match beatdowns every single time because that's exactly what happened on this episode. And if they did it by accident, then that's just poor planning, poor structure. You don't know what I mean. If it's one of those things that when the episode was over, they're like, oh, shoot. You know, there's there's four post-match angles. Then that's a really bad sign. Maybe they think that's something that people want. Uh, it's it's not. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. And I'm not the only one that uh, pointed that out. I saw that on social media as well. So, yes, Chris Bay gets a win. I thought it was pretty good. Um, and is they, this is I, I, I uh, we'll get into this in a little bit when they when they meet up with Santino Santino um, backstage. I guess there was another Ash by Elegance video. I didn't see it. So I don't know what happened. I just, I didn't notice it. I will say about um, watching on the Ultimate Insider, I always have a good idea based on the likes on a video, how many people are watching. Because there's a, there is a, a like to view ratio that's pretty, pretty standard across YouTube. So I've always estimated that the Ultimate Insider had about 10,000 viewers per episode. I am estimating 15,000 at this point. I think it is, has gone um, based on the engagement and just my experience with YouTube. My, uh, some, my, my estimation is that it's gone up 5,000 viewers. So if that's the case, that's awesome because a viewer on Ultimate Insiders means more financially to the company than an extra viewer walking, watching on Access TV. So I think that's a very good thing. And... Um, I do have people tell me, no, I th think it's probably like 20, 30, 40, 000. it's not, it's not. And even though it doesn't bother me and it doesn't bother a lot of you, statistically, people don't like watching episodic television on YouTube. That's why, um, is it called YouTube Red? That, that for a while they tried to have their own original series and um, they all bombed, you know? That's what uh, Cobra Kai was actually on initially and they ended up cutting the deal with Netflix because that was their only successful series. And uh, I thought they actually had good programming on there. I watched a few seasons of things, but people don't use YouTube for episodic television. And that that's the proof for you right there. They try to have their own channel. Basically it completely bombed. That's it just, that's just how it is. So for, for those of you who think they're like doubling their TV viewership and stuff, I assure, assure you they're fucking not. All right, um, Frankie Gazarian had a, a little, you know, he said next week I'm going to ad address what happened, and then Rich Swan came. And they kind of started laying the groundwork for maybe Rich Swan turning as well, which I think would be needed. He's one of the more, as much as I love Rich Swan, he's one of the more stale characters in the company. Just real lack of character progression. When he won the world title, the, there was no change in demeanor. No change in character. When he lost the title, there was no change. And that's why he's kind of back in the X division. And, uh, you know, AJ Francis even pointed it out like, hey, where did we first meet in the back of the plane? Who's still in the back of the plane? So um, looked horrible. Again, uh, I'm not going to beat him up too much because this is the same taping. But talking to rich swan non-existent aj francis's beard was just completely blended into the background horrible editing horrible lighting um we're gonna see what happens this this orlando tapings if they if someone looked back at this and said wow this looks bad or if they think it looks good it doesn't but if they think it does we're gonna know because it's gonna continue in the orlando tapings so 
let's see what happens. But it it um it's the the really really the only hole in the show. I mean, <laughs> the show freaking looks great. The the only hole is the backstage segments, which are as amateur as they come. If I were to screenshot these backstage segments and putting it put it next to WWE, AEW, and even NWA, and we just had a panel of the four. You would see what I'm talking about if you don't already see. It's um, the worst in wrestling. The worst in wrestling, the, the backstage, back, backstage segments. Speaking of the worst in wrestling, uh, Dirty Dango. We got him in the ring with Oleg Prudius versus Damian Drake, Drake and Dante King. Uh, I did think him, him talking on the phone during the match was kind of funny. And maybe it was because because uh, I was part of the live audience. The experience is so different. Maybe if I was tuning into this for the first time on TV, maybe I would have thought it was so funny. This is not a uh, team that's over right now. Um, I guess some some weeks I kind of like Dango. Sometimes I don't. You know, I typically like what Johnny Bravo does. Um, Oleg Prudius, I don't really care. But this is just not a uh, – this whole – little group is not necessary not not they're just not over at the moment um i think where the big miss was they could have they could have and should have put the digital media title on dirty dango at one point and i think he had two matches with joe hendry and failed to get the title either of those two matches and sometimes when you give someone a loss like that there's not a lot of coming back from it because what are these guys what is their mission what is the mission statement for this stable, this unit? They're just kind of coming in and having matches no one really cares about. Now, if Dango were to, to at one point have won the digital media championship and tie that in with this new gimmick of his, it could have worked. And I think he could be a little more relevant on screen right now, but I don't know where they're going with these dudes. Um, I don't think right now it's working because it just it just feels it feels unnecessary what they're doing feels unnecessary. And I think there's enough talent in that little group to, to figure it out. But we, what are they doing? You know, these two guys, Damian Drake and Dante King, they come out. And again, at the live, t- ex- you know, the live experience of taping, we're expecting surprises and debuts. And so when these guys come in running out, it's like, Whoa, who are these guys? Oh, they're fucking jobbers. So, yeah. And then, um, the Grizzled Young Vets did a a backstage segment here. I said this before; they don't do anything for me. I'm not. I, I recognize that they're good, but for me as a fan, they they don't do anything for me. They're just they're just a couple of dudes. Santino comes out, and Santino. I'm re- actually really surprised they brought him into this. TNA, but he's here. I'm entertained by Santino, but he always comes and makes these matches that he it, it appears he's he's coming up with the decisions on the spot, but but he's not because the you, you, you he kind of comes out like you know what I know how I'm going to handle this. How about a best of three match? You know, it, yeah. It's hard to explain what I'm saying. He the 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 matches and stipulations he put together put, puts together aren't they're not simple concepts. I guess is what I'm saying. Like they're clearly things you got to sit down and think about. You don't just come up with that on the fly. And he just shows up out of nowhere. Like I know how we will we will settle this in a five out of six falls tickle my dick match. You know what I'm saying? So um, we're getting a best out of three. I don't don't really care. <laughs> I guess um, a lot of you will enjoy it, but I've already stated I'm not like Mr. ABC, and and these guys don't do a lot for me, so I kind of don't really care. But but they should put on for what it's worth. They should put on good matches. I had said when I predicted Hard to Kill that these guys were gonna that the ABC would win at hard to kill, but these guys would win the titles immediately. I still feel that way. 
That's that's just what this company does. Then Jim Miller is inter- speaking of this bad, bad editing and lighting. Jim Miller is interviewing a Motor City Machine Guns and Okada backstage. You've got Okada on your television, and this looks awful. Um, I again, I'm 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 gonna hope that with this next taping here that they looked at this and said, yo, this, this isn't going to work. I really, I really hope it's very possible that when they were recording television, it looked great in real time, you know? And then when the guys got the footage backstage, they just had to edit it. They're like, you know, hopefully they're going to look back at this and say, this does not look good and fix it. But again, Gia Miller casting a giant shadow over Okada over um, Alex Shelley, Okada speaking, or uh, it was either Okada or Chris Saban was speaking. There's a giant shadow over, over uh, Gia's face. I mean, just amateur hour up in here. Things pick up at this point. We get Jordan Grace versus Trinity for the knockouts world championship. I said this on Twitter. I, I don't think any part timer, for lack of a better term, that's what I'm going to call them. I don't think any part-timer has made such an impact on the company and left it better than they found it, like Trinity did. Her tw- Twitter bio reads, knockout for life. I Honestly, she probably wanted to stay. She probably wishes she could have stayed, but you cannot turn that WWE money down. Like That's just ridiculous to do that. Um, she's still relatively young. You just don't, you know what I mean? Um, but I think part of her would have just loved to remain with the company. And she's letting us know that by saying she's a knockout for life. And, and, you know, I think they did a going away for her with a cake and all that stuff. It was, it was, um, she had a, she, I think she was around for eight months. She moved, moved the needle a little bit with, with uh viewership, which is, you know, hard to, hard to do. But she did do that a little. Uh, she was a great ambassador for the company, but she truly left it better than she found it. You know, you, you cannot argue that. And she seemed to have a real impact on the people backstage because people seemed very um, disappointed she was leaving. And I think she was she was disappointed as well. So um, as Tom Hannafin says, this is Trinity's contractual rematch. This was, this was a good match too. Um, you know, I think Jordan has gotten the best out of Trinity, out of out of all these matches she had. And I said it last week. I just I can't believe that Trinity's whole run was hugs and handshakes. There was just nobody got any heat wrestling Trinity. You know, the Deanna Perazzo matches weren't serious, and she beat Giselle Shaw. She ran through Giselle Shaw several times, but after that, it was all. Hugs and handshakes with the baby faces. I just, I can't believe that was what they did. Um, that's why I was so confident that Jordan Grace was going to turn heel because I, I was just like, surely this is leading up to something. She cannot get along with every, every single opponent, but uh, that's what it was. That was Trinity's run. So I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Uh, I'm curious how many Twitter followers Jordan Grace gained over the last several days. I'd be very curious, but the company's doing a good job in putting together some, you know, some of her, her moments and her good matches. And that's what you want to use, utilize the library for, you know, not, not trying to piggyback off what other companies are doing. You know, that's, that's what I want to see. And speaking of, I said, I wouldn't hamper um, on this too long in 2024. But I made a joke last week because I said, oh, I followed TNA on Twitter again. I unfollow all their socials. And I said, but they're doing Twitter right now. So I followed them. And I said, but for all we know, they're going to post a Deanna Perrazzo clip next time she wrestles on AEW. Guess the fuck what? Deanna has a match with Ty Valkyrie, who's a jobber in that company. And they did it. They posted the Diada video. 
Diana versus Taya. So I unfollowed them again. And I don't do that to be dramatic, folks, but I'm I I care about what's on my news feed. It doesn't matter what the social media platform is. That real estate is important to me, whether it's people I care about or things I care about. I will not follow shit I don't want to see. And I don't want to see that style of social media. So I, I just unfollowed. Easy as that. So that's that <laughs> regarding my love-hate relationship with them. But Trinity loses again. Um, I always said Trinity would lose one match. Or if she has a rematch, she will lose two. But I said those are the only times she would lose in TNA. And that's exactly what happened. Guess what? There's a post-match beatdown afterwards. Giselle Shaw hitting him with the X. I don't expect Giselle to beat Jordan Grace. And she's going to be in deep trouble booking-wise. And people people caring if she loses to Jordan, which she likely will, especially after that freaking rumble appearance. Jordan is not dropping that thing anytime soon, but you know, Giselle is, um, she's on a big time losing streak. She's, I, I mean, obviously she won it hard to kill, lost a lot of matches, lost a lot of title matches. She's about to lose another title match. I don't understand what they're doing with her, but yeah, post match beat down. I have to apologize also. I said last week that when the system did their backstage promo that Alicia was wearing the same clothes that she wore on this week's episode, and I was wrong. She was not. So maybe she had her Bound for Glory dress on. That might have been what it was, and I got confused, but I do need to admit that I was wrong because I very confidently told you guys she would be wearing the same outfit (laughs) two weeks in a row. And she did it. So um, my bad on that. I did mess up. After this, uh, so Josh Alexander did a little angle back, backstage. And, you know, they got these red and blue curtains behind him. And, and I, I think they look decent. Um, Josh, this looked fine. This looked a lot better. I just don't understand why the earlier segment couldn't look like this. Or the GM Miller stuff. I, I don't. This looks good. Leave it like this. Alan Angels walks up. And this was, um, I think this was the second time tonight, or they might have done it last week. Again, this is AEW shit. Someone's cutting a promo, and someone walks in and interrupts them. They're standing three feet away. We're supposed to believe the wrestler doesn't see them. Um, it's I, I, I hate it. But anyway, Alan Angels came out. And uh, announce he has a talk show coming. I don't know what to think of this because I love Alan Angels. So I want to give this a chance. But these are typically not good in wrestling. There's Every once in a while, there's one that kind of hits. But they're usually not good. So he asks um, Josh Alexander to be his first guest. So we'll see what, what it is. It did add some flavor to Josh here because he started off the promo talking about the same stuff he always talks about. So added a little spice, a little juice. So we'll see what happens with Josh Alexander next week on the sound check. We got Nick Nemeth versus Zachary Wentz. It was cool to see Nick Nemeth in a TNA ring. These are, you know, Tom Hennepin's good at putting things over like this, where he's letting you know this is the first time, the first time ever, the first time that he is uh, wrestling as Nick Nemeth. And the first time, I think he said his first match outside of WWE. And uh, I'm I'm confident that uh, myself and the, and the negative army successfully got Tom Hannafin to stop saying first time ever because this is two episodes in a row that he hasn't done it. So um, we successfully pulled this off because there's been nothing but fresh matches and he hasn't done it a single time. So this was good. We knew Zachary Wentz was going to lose. You know, there's no, no freaking surprise there, but I think this is a good opponent to give him that can work. Um, And Matt Raywall did a good job of pointing out that the Rascals kind of got screwed at Hard to Kill because they had a contract contractual rematch. Should have been two on two. 
and it was a four way. And they did, you know, Impact has done that a lot over the years. They use people's contract, you know, contractual rematch clause and add other people to the mix. I hate rematches. I hate the, I hate that wrestlers should get automatic rematches because they dropped the title. You know, it's weird because like Trinity, they're saying she had a contractual rematch. She went on Twitter and asked for the rematch. She's like, you want, let's have a rematch, Jordan Grace. Said, okay, sounds good. So I, I just wish they would kind of get away from it. Um, After the match, there was a beatdown after Nemeth won. N- N- Nemeth won with a danger zone. I always talk about bad finishers in Impact, and this is just another one. This is another one added um, to the, the, the mix. The wrestler looks goofy taking it. Standing there waiting for it. I've never thought this was a good finisher. So it's perfect to be in DNA. But yeah, there was a post-match beatdown, of course. And um, it was by Steve Macklin. So I'm looking forward to Nemeth versus Steve Macklin. This is going to be great. And I love that they're not just throwing Nemeth in the title picture. They're making him earn it. He says he wants to earn it. I think it's going to be like Mickey James last rodeo where she's like, Hey, I want to earn a knockouts title match. She wrestles four girls and then she has a knockouts title match. She was like, Hey, I'm going to wrestle the whole roster. She wrestled half the roster and maybe and then got her title shot. So that's probably, where we're going to go with Nick Nemeth. Like he's probably going to wrestle one or two. He's probably going to like, I think he wrestles Trey Miguel next. He's going to have those matches. He's going to have one feud and then he's probably going to work to the title picture. Then um, Crazy Steve cut a little promo backstage, and uh, Rhino entered. Uh, it's, uh, um, introduced himself into the picture. I said, "Here we fucking go." But I actually thought wrong. Excellent. I would. I'm. I'm cool with. Dude, I wouldn't be okay. If, I mean, I wouldn't be mad if Rhino didn't talk more because I just, I don't know. I, I'm just, I know I'm just just a small-time podcaster, but I challenge Rhino to do something different. It's the same, the fucking the gore and the, the same outfit. And even when he was with the design, with a uh, Violent by Design, you know, they, they cleansed them of his sins like they do with Cody Diener. And then he showed up the next week looking exactly the same and nothing changed. I, I would just love to see Rhino do something different. But I, w- I wouldn't mind if he talked a little, you know, didn't talk a little more. I thought he sounded really good here. And, cl- you know, clearly we're going to get a, an angle with him and Crazy Steve. And then they did a little decay video package that I thought was um, pretty good as well. I was watching this. And I was like, man, it, there's been so many versions of decay. There was, there was crazy Steve and abyss. And then later they added Rosemary and then it was Rosemary and crazy Steve. And then it was Rosemary, crazy Steve and black Taurus. And then it was just crazy Steve and black Taurus. No, no, no. I'm sorry. And then, then havoc came into the picture. And then Havoc left, and then it was just, I think that's when the death doll thing happened, and then it was just Crazy Steve and Black Taurus. And now it's Rosemary and Havoc. So it's almost like LAX. <laughs> it's just different different versions of it. Um, I think that this is the last version we'll ever see, though. I, I don't, I can't imagine it would, it would branch off on top of this. Uh, but I thought they did a little good thing, uh, you know, a good little video here, and it, it's we want more of this. The Death Dolls was was cool for what it was. Havoc and and um, or what it was a like Jessica and Courtney. It was okay for what it was, but the, this is where this is what suits them best. They kind of tried to give us a version of why they're no longer Courtney and um, and uh, Jessica. I guess it worked. It was a little quick and lazy overall, but I mean it worked. It's they're they're glossing over it. They just want to get to what matters. We got Danny Luna and Jody Red Hair versus two more girls with red hair. Um, MK Ultra. 
I get the impression Danny Luna and Jody Thread are pretty close because I saw them backstage. Not backstage, but uh, walking around the concession stand. They, they look like they hang out. Um, so they're probably at one point going to get a run trying to challenge for the Knockouts Tag Team Championships because they're a tag team now, I think. And that's all you have to do in TNA. Like, I could form a tag team and I could get a title shot for the Knockouts uh, within a month, you know? The graphic of this was really funny because it looked like Jody Thread had a black eye because she only had mascara on one eye and not the other. If you guys see the graphic, you'll see what I'm talking about. You probably missed it because Killer Kelly looks phenomenal in this graphic. Last week I had mentioned um, when Frankie Kazarian did his heel turn, I said there was, you know, there's another, um, I I think I might have said wrestler rather than wrestlers, but I, I said there's someone else going a different direction with their character. And that's kind of where they're going with MK ultra here. So clearly there's a heel turn. Uh, clearly they had a heel turn because uh, they did a post match beat down of Danny Luna and Jody after the match. Um, the match overall was, was cool, but MK ultra is just great. You know, I think we're, I think this feud with decay is going to last a very long time but I think everyone's entertaining enough and good enough that it won't be too stale, but I think they're going to wrestle each other for a long time. Obviously MK ultra wins this match. And again, post match be down. And we got our main event, uh, Kuzichika Okada and the motor city machine guns against the system. The graphic for this, this is the best Eddie Edwards has ever looked. This is the best photo he has ever taken. Every other photo that Eddie Edwards takes looks like his stomach hurts. It looks like he's trying to sing while his stomach hurts. So I thought this was his his best picture. And his hair, this is, you know, I can live with this hair. Like there was a while he looked absolutely ridiculous. Um, but I can dig this. So this match at this point, because uh, it was the main event when we were there, and I was I was a little tired by the time we got there. This was, um, you know, this was Okada's return to TNA. I didn't watch the very, very end, so I don't think the broadcast showed his his little promo. But he said, you know, people think I hate TNA. I don't hate TNA. You know, I don't remember what else he said, but you know, it was it was a cool little promo. This was good because the Motor City Machine Guns do need a win, uh, especially Alex Shelley. We need to remember they cannot do what they did with Rich Swan, where. He drops the title and then becomes a loser. Like you got to keep uh, winning fresh when it comes to Alex Shelley. I thought Okada, it, t- it took a while to get him in the ring. And that makes sense because you want to wait for him to come in. You know, you don't want to just, uh, hey, Okada's here, and then have him start the match. You know, you got to you gotta tease us a little bit. But I thought he wrestled extremely safe. I think the first time he tagged in, I think he tagged out within 30 seconds. Um, he wrestled extremely safe, so we didn't get, you know, peak Okada here. But the fans loved him. Um, you know, my daughter got a picture with him afterwards, and I said, you know, that's really special. I was like, because getting a picture with Okada is almost impossible, you know, given that he was has been in Japan all this time. You know, that's it's rare that you can get a picture like that. Um, that's why I actually paid up to get my picture with Trinity. Cause I said, you know what, this is probably my last opportunity to do that. Um, I really should have got a Will Ospreay one as well, but pretty decent six, six man tag, you know, overall it was a little bit safe. We knew who was going to win this thing. Uh, we knew the machine guys and Okada were going to win. And of course they did. And then we got the Mustafa um, Mustafa, I guess Mustafa. I say Mustafa because I'm thinking of like Colonel Mustafa when I was a kid, but Mustafa Ali. Anyway, um, I'm going to struggle with that one. They played his little video package. Very well done. You can tell this guy can talk. Um, I fully expect him to win the exhibition championship. I don't expect that he is signed long-term. I don't think he wants to work for anybody. I think he wants to be his, his own boss. I mean, he, I think they said he he grossed the most um, ticket sale revenue from his appearances for any post WWE wrestler. That means you're 
earning potential in the indies is unlimited. Once you now have that distinction, like there's no reason for this dude to be tied down anywhere. So I think him, much like Nick Nemeth, is here for a little bit. And I said something last week that people probably didn't like, and it's that Ash by Elegance might be the big signing because there's been no graphic that Nick Nemeth is around. There's been no, there's no, they didn't drop anything that Mustafa Ali is around long term. He's going to be, Ali is going to be here through like April and March, I believe. Like he, he is, you know, he's got quite a few dates booked, but I don't think either of these guys are signed. I think Ash is the big signing, folks. We'll see. We'll see. But I fully expect this dude to come in and um, win the X Division Championship within his first, I'm going to say, three matches. No, I'm going to say out of his, between his first two matches. It might be his first match, but I'm going to I'm gonna say maybe second. Like Maybe he gets that like Allen Angels match and then wrestles for the title. But he he's going to be your X Division Champion before Rebellion. I fucking promise you on that one. So overall, I thought the episode was okay. Uh, um, maybe okay isn't fair. I thought it was a good episode. I don't. I don't want. I don't want to say okay, and you think it means that I don't. That I was bored with it. I think it was very solid. They got to fix the fix the backstage stuff. They absolutely have to. Uh, they got to cut it down with the post match beatdowns. Um, that is going to really dilute your show because no one actually wants to see that. Once every couple of weeks, and if it makes sense on the storyline, cool. But don't use that as an excuse, as a crutch, to advance storyline. So um, I think next week's show looks good. We're going to see how this whole Orlando thing looks because it did not seem like they sold a lot of seats for it. So we're going to see. Um, I keep telling you guys, we're going to know if it's popping or not when when this when the tapings after Las Vegas air. That's whatever product they give us. That's what we're getting. Okay, so this is going to be really interesting to see what they do. So I'm your boy. BQ again. I'm sorry this dropped a little bit late, but I did want to drop it on that ass, and uh, I will talk to you guys again soon. Peace.